Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another humble little tutorial video, this time on how to fly the DC-6 without using the flight engineer. We're going to go from Anchorage to Fairbanks, one of the native homes of the DC-6 these days. Got a charter flight, and we're going to do this without GPS, without the flight engineer, just like we would have done in the 1960s, VOR to VOR navigation. It's a short flight, it should take about an hour. So let's take a look at the, uh, the flight plan. And for that, of course, we'll use a little nav map because we have to use something. So here we are at Ted Stevens. It's going to be easy to get out of here. We just make a little U-turn here and we'll go out to runway 33. There's very little wind, although it is a headwind. And we are going to go up here near uh, Denali National Park to Fairbanks and shoot an ILS approach into Fairbanks on runway 2 left. So rather than searching for VORs, and you can see there's two of them here, we're going to use an interesting little tool, a little nav map, would automatically generate a flight plan. So you go into flight plan, calculate flight plan, and we're going to an 8,000 foot cruise altitude. Looking down here at the bottom, that's fine. We'll, we'll clear everything at 8,000. And we'll, we should get some good views because we won't be too high. We're going to use radio nav aids, but we're not going to use NDBs. Uh, NDB is a, stands for non-directional beacon. That's what you use your ADF or automatic direction finder to look at. We won't use those. We're just going to use VORs. You hit calculate. You can close that. Let's see what it did to us. Well, we've got a initial VOR here, which is Big Lake. And then we fly outbound from there to the Fairbanks VOR. And, wow, that's a real nice flight plan, actually, because that'll take me right across the ILS. So we can just stay on this radial until we see the ILS, and then we'll just turn right on in. So that's pretty convenient. Uh, one of the nice things about little NavMap's auto flight plan tool like this is that it'll automatically take into account whether or not you've got uh, the sufficient range on the VOR. You've noticed Fairbanks is a code FAI, and there's an H after it. There's also an H after Big Lake. Uh, that means it's a high-power VOR. Uh, you've, if you've flown VORs before, you know, sometimes you don't pick them up. Even though you can see them on the map, it usually means you're too far away. And so this will automatically take that into account. Uh, if you don't believe me, you can look at this and see Add Nav Aid Range Ring, which it'll add a range ring of 200 nautical miles because that's the power of the Big Lake VOR. So you can see we can take Big Lake. We'd stay on it pretty much all the way to Fairbanks if we wanted to. And the Fairbanks VOR, if we had a range ring there, you can see it's also a 200 nautical mile range. So we should have really, really good radio coverage basically from either VOR for this entire flight. So that'll work. Once you add these range rings like this and you want to get rid of them eventually, go to Map and then Remove All Ranges, Measurements, and Holdings. And then I'll get rid of it. So... Our first VOR there is uh, 1125, and we're going to fly to it. So we take off from here. I'm just going to kind of turn north after we take off, although we pretty much are going to take off to the north, until I see this VOR. Then I'm going to fly to it, and then I'm going to fly away from it on the 353 radial, and I'm going to stay on that for, I don't know, 50 or 100 miles or so, at which point I should see Fairbanks at uh, 1086. And then we'll look for the ILS. So we will be managing all this ourselves. ILS approach into Fairbanks looks like this. So here's the, the localizer. And it's saying 15 nautical miles from cache, uh, which is this waypoint on the, uh, on the localizer. Uh, you want to be at 2600. So here somewhere around... Silax, which is 17.3 out. That's a little bit further out here. Uh, we come in here at 2600. Uh, we're good. And then once we pass that, Silax, we can drop the 2100, and that'll bring us right in underneath the glide slope, which will be perfect. That's it. We're planned. <laughs> so let's go ahead and then uh, hop in the plane. So this is, uh, this is what you're going to see when you jump in this thing. Uh, there's a lot of dials and gauges in here. Um, 
and we will cover some of them. I'll certainly cover all the ones I can, and uh, let's get going. So you come over here to the iPad, which again is how you interface with this thing, and let's get rid of all the equipment outside, and let's get closed up. Okay, we're all closed up, ready to go. Uh, the plane is off. Um, I'm going to leave the ground power unit there because we're going to use that for a startup, and then we'll get rid of it later. So, and we'll take some just cockpit lighting just to make sure. So, we go up the overhead panel. And you can see a couple of switches here. Um... This is the selector switch for whether or not we want the plane to be on battery, which is, of course, once we leave the gate area, um, or we want to be on ground power. We want to be on ground power. So you put that, you see the little light, that means it's available. And that's because we've got our little ground power unit hooked up, supplying us with some power. And so now we turn the airplane on. That's it. That's the master switch right there, um, if you think of it that way. So we've got uh, some of our instruments came alive. So we can get our engine generators ready to work. And we need to turn on our power inverters. We do that, everything else will start working. Some of the systems run on DC, some run on AC. Uh, this plane is so old. You, you think of it in a power inverter like you have in a car or something uh, so that you can make 110 volt plug power off your 12 volt car battery. And it's an electronic box full of, well, electronics. And uh, that's fine if you got integrated circuits. Back when this plane was designed, you actually have a DC motor that is coupled to an AC generator. And so you have one motor spinning a generator, and that's how it makes AC. <laughs> it's kind of definitely the old-fashioned way. So the plane is effectively on at this point. Uh, we can turn on some lights. Lights are up here. We'll turn on our beacon because we're getting ready to start our engines. You can turn on other lights if you want to. I'm not going to bother. So, and we'll get our radios going. Don't turn the radios on. And they're up. That's about it. So, the first thing I always do if it's not windy is I undo the gust lock because I don't want to forget. If you're not sure, then when you push a throttle forward, if you see these two throttles stop moving, that's because that's a safety catch. That tells you that's for takeoff to prevent you from taking off with the gust lock on. So if you go like this and you feel two throttles stop moving, that's your safety alert that, hey, you've got to take off your gust lock. That's down here. The hot spot, the click spot, I should say, for this thing is this fat part of this handle. You click on that, and there will be a delay, which is really annoying. And then it goes. And now we can move our controls, and we're, we're good to go. So, with that said, let's get ready to get our engine started and warmed up. They take some time. There's an official procedure for this, but I'm just going to show you what, uh, what I do just to get going in the game. So, mixtures. Make sure they're rich. That last one. Let's get some fuel pumps on. And get our mags ready to go. There's a bit of a script for starting these engines, so it's not super realistic. Um, but this will work. So we've got fuel. We should have fuel. Oh, we got some tanks on. And, and check the fuel. So go over here. We're going to need, according to the flight plan, about 700 gallons. So I'll take a little extra. Go to load manager. You can see right now it's loaded to half. So our main tanks are full. Our alternates are empty. That'll get you about half. You come over here. You click the down arrow. That'll zero it out. Then you click the up arrow. 
every time you move the scroll wheel, it'll add a little bit of fuel. So if we do that, there's 6,000 total pounds. That's 1,000 gallons. And we'll take, I'll go seven. That'll work. And so if you look over here, we now have our fuel. We've got 17,000 in there. Excuse me, 1,700 in there in each one. Now, the, the needles point different directions because these gauges are all a little bit different. <laughs> so don't worry about it. This one's obviously been through some battle. So now we turn on the fuel valves, push them forward. That goes to the main tank. And we do that. With our pumps on, we should have fuel pressure. Which we don't. Why don't we? Don't know why that didn't take. And we've got fuel pressure, which is good. That means we're ready to start the engines. Mixture set. Mags on. And we can start going through the script. I will start them with the cowl flaps closed until they warm up. And then I'll open up the cowl flaps. So here we go. We start 2, 3, 1, 2. like that order. So start. We'll crank it. Six. At nine, I'll prime the fuel. Nine. And boost. Twelve. Let me turn this stuff off. And you can see that number three is running. Let's do number four. Start sequence now goes to two. That runs the starter. Three. Waiting for make Six. sure the engine turns. Five. Prime injects fuel straight into Twelve. the engine. And prime, or excuse me, boost, enables the magnetos to generate a little bit of extra voltage, which they have to do because they're turning slowly on starter. This thing doesn't have an ignition system like a car. It's got magnetos, which basically all piston aircraft do. And uh, essentially, they're little miniature generators that make the electricity for the spark. Uh, so they're independent of the electrical system of the aircraft. Unfortunately, when they're cranking, it's turning pretty slowly, and they don't generate enough voltage. So you have to boost the coil voltage with this switch. One more to go. check to make sure you should do this as you start the engines of course but you want to check make sure there's oil pressure which we have we have fuel pressure we've got our oil temperature coming up so we started three and four so they're up at 40 and uh, two has come up to 30 and one is still cool that's basically because of the order in which we started the engines Got a good idle speed. Manifold pressure is low, obviously, because we're at idle. Cylinder heads are warming up, but not too hot, so we're good. 
I'll talk a little bit about the panel here while the engines warm up. Airspeed indicator, pretty straightforward. Artificial horizon, very old design. Air voltimeter, calibrated, ready to go. We have a navigation display here. This is our ADF, so this is, this is will point at, if the nose is pointed directly at a non-directional beacon, this arrow will be pointing straight ahead. And so this tells you what direction a non-directional beacon is on. Now, unfortunately, if you're crabbing, it may not point. It may point over here if you're flying to it, because it'll be crabbing to the right. And so the ADF is not really good about, you know, navigating when you're crosswinds. You can find stuff and fly to it, but uh, for navigation purposes, it's better to use a, a VOR. So for that, we have our our uh, course deviation indicator uh, for the VOR. Uh, hopefully people are familiar with this. We'll set this up, and if the needle is left, that means the course we want is to the left. If the needle is to the right, that means the course we want is to the right. And we have another one down here that's a little simpler. This simply points at the VOR. So if this needle is centered, this thing is pointed directly to it or away from it. We have a directional gyro, and uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Turn and bag indicator, although to be honest, I never use that that much. Here's our DME equipment. We're going to put that on nav one. That's pretty much it. So we will take off the 50 degrees of flaps. So let's get those going. That's our flap lever. Here's our gear lever. It's a nice day. We're not going to run into any icing conditions, so I'm not going to go over all that. It does have the equipment for it, though. get set up for our first VOR, which is Big Lake, 112.5. So we're going to go up here, and we're going to set this thing for 112.5. And make it active. And that's it. We're not picking it up here yet on the ground. So I'm going to take off to the north. As soon as we pop in the air, we'll probably see it. I'm just going to kind of fly north. <laughs> and uh, well, well, we'll hit it pretty quickly. And then when I do that, I'll turn the OBS until I center the needle with a two flag. And once I've done that, I'm going to tell the autopilot to keep it centered, and that'll take us straight over the top of it. That looks like we're ready to go. Parking, parking brake release, and we'll give it a little bit of gas. Want to come out of here? You turn around. There we go. There's the runway. 33, that's the one we want. So 
Sorry guys, I'm used to flying in VR facilities here. Stop here for a second. Now we look. Very good enough. Okay, so I want to set our cowl flaps for takeoff. That's important. They do add drag. They're very important, but they do add drag. So we're going to close those to take off position of three degrees. We're going to power up to 50 inches or thereabout. We'll do a dry takeoff. We won't need water injection because this is a really long runway. And as soon as we get up, you'll see me get the plane more or less uh, trimmed out. And we'll come down here and I'll activate the autopilot with that and that little switch right there. Right there. All right, flaps. Make sure we're good. Here we go. will go. Increase it slowly to 50. And about 90 or 100 here will rotate slowly. that it's going to grab a, a wing level and then a v-speed that's a little hot so let's slow down a little bit we'll take the power back to 40 inches in the rpm down to 2400 nice climb power This little wheel I'm scrolling down here in the lower right, that is the pitch command. So right now the autopilot is doing wings leveling and pitching. And we're heading north. There's our VOR. So I want to fly to it. I'm going to want to fly to it just a little, a little bit off north. There it is. Right there. on localizer control which is also VOR control and now we'll turn and the autopilot will keep that needle centered as we climb out and we're on our way to Big Lake we're climbing a thousand feet a minute that's healthy we're at 160 airspeed flaps up there they go they're coming up and they're up that'll enable us to start speeding up you can run flaps anywhere below 160, so I usually leave them on until I'm stabilized because I don't want to mess with my trim. Then I put them up and we'll get some more speed. Forty inches, somewhere on 190-ish on the torque. 2400 is a good climb. We should go to climb power settings now. Six degrees. How are we doing on cylinder heads? Ah, they're fine. They're on the green. It's a nice cool day. Not to worry too much about the temperatures.
still a nice climb rate, good airspeed. We're doing about 1,200 feet a minute. Now you're going to have to keep chasing the power as we climb in the upper atmosphere. The air's going to get thinner, so we're going to need more and more throttle opening to hold 40 inches and to hold our torque setting. But this is a comfortable climb. You know, there may be a better way to do it, but it's okay here. Got 13 nautical miles to Big Lake. It's counting down, which is good. Now coming out of Big Lake, we're going to want a particular radio from. And from our flight plan, that was 353. So when we cross over it, it won't be much of a turn. It'll just be a little bit of a tip to the right. We'll be heading for Fairbanks. Throttle opening here. That's something the AFE does if you use it. If you're flying it the old fashioned way, you gotta sit there on the throttle and make little bitty adjustments as you climb. Sure, nice out. I guess we should probably set the cabin pressurization. So we're going to climb at 8,000. We don't need it yet, but we're going to climb at 8,000. So what I do is I set the flight here. for an 8,000 foot climb, 8,000 foot uh, cruise speed, or cruise <laughs> altitude. So you can see the cabin depressurized. And so now what's happening is I turn the pressurization on. It's going to go ahead and re I should have done this on the ground. But going to go ahead and repressurize the cabin. So now the cabin is descending. That's because the pressure is going up. Here's a differential pressure. You can see it's going up. Fairbanks has an elevation of 439 feet. That's where you set this guy. So we'll set this to 400 feet or something. And then this, uh, the Kalman system will automatically depressurize us when we come down and get to 400 feet or so uh, in time for touchdown. Uh, should have said it earlier, would have maintained it better, but that's how it works. It's pretty simple. The cabin's comfortable at 65. Let me turn on our cabin heater. That'll get the guys some air. We should probably put our pedo heat on, even though it's okay. This is a lot of power. It's, I got the heater going now. Burns gasoline. 65 is kind of cool, even for Alaska, so let's make the passenger a little more comfortable here. We'll turn them up to 70. This will start going up. We'll check it in a minute and see if it gets there. You can see it's starting to move already. Okay, it passed 8,000. Now we do is level off. So we put it on altitude hold mode. And now it's going to hold whatever altitude it's stopped at. We're also coming up on Big Lake. Two, two nautical miles. So we're close enough now. I'm going to put it on heading mode so it doesn't do any weird when it flips over the VOR. Okay, so now it's going to maintain roll. So keep the wings level until we cross Big Lake. We're speeding up. We'll probably decrease the throttle a little bit. About there, about 150. 150 on the manifold pressure and 2200 RPM is a nice cruise. There's 2200. And 150-ish on the VMAP, which is torque. I'll talk about that in a minute. And we should get between now uh, 210-ish, 220, something like that, depending on weight. So, have we crossed Big Lake? Oh, we just lost it, so we're right on top of it. We'll pick it back up. Eventually, 
eventually will pick it up, I promise. Oh, wait a minute, there we go. 2728. Oh, okay, we're past it, so we're going away from it. So now I want a 353 radio. So I'm going to turn this until I'm on 353. About there. You can see it's off to the right. Remember, it's kind of, we have to turn to the right, so that's what it's telling us now, right? Let me turn to the right. So I'll put it on localizer, the autopilot. Now it'll turn to the right and center the needle. We'll let it do its job. We cruise now, so now we can close the cow flaps all, or to cruise anyway. That'll get us some speed. So zero is cruise. You see the cow flaps are closed now. If I open them, you see the difference. That's open. Close them. It's important to keep those closed and cruise because they actually get you some speed. The uh, people think cow flaps, you know, they're just kind of they're there to cool the engine. Well, that's true. It's not the full story. The front of these engines, that cowling is very specially designed. It's called a NACA cowling. What it does is it takes air coming into the engine and it doesn't let it all out. It actually pressurizes a little bit. And when it pressurizes, it goes across the cylinders with some pressure. Not much, not like 100 PSI or anything crazy, but a little bit. At least whatever. 210 knots will get you. And then the cylinders heat it up. And when they heat it up, the volume expands. And then when the cow flaps are closed, it's going to squirt out the back, kind of like a poor man's ramjet engine. Right, the P51 Mustang has that thing down hanging off the belly where it uses the engine heat to generate a little bit of thrust. That's exactly what's happening here. You read about it, there's differing opinions, but people will tell you that with a NACA cowling, which is efficient, and the cow flaps closed, the whole system all together essentially neutralizes the drag of the engine. So we're getting the engine cooling for free without any drag penalty. So the prop's pulling the plane as if the rest of the engine wasn't even there. And so that gets you some speed, and we're coming up a little 215 now that we got those cow flaps closed. Remember, we're at 205, 210. Have we got another five knots or something? It's pretty good. It's worth doing. We can also lean out the mixture for cruise, although it's not a very long flight. So we just go one notch. Be careful not to go two. That'll shut it off. <laughs> and you can see we've lost a little torque. That's because we leaned it out. So we're going to open up the throttle a little bit more get our 150 back and we have a fuel flow of 600 pounds per hour each engine that's perfect that's right about where we should be for a cruise and we're on the needle we're on the line although we don't have the GPS so we got to know make sure we know what we're doing not that I've got little nav map open on my other monitor or anything like that. No, no, no. Never, never would do that. 17.6. We could probably maybe pick up that other one. We'll see. Let's talk about the gauges a little bit. So, you've got four gauges here and then a, and then a stack of them here. So, here's our fuel pressure, oil pressure. Those are important as long as they're kind of where they are there. Let's talk about BMAP. When you see these gauges, that is the torque being transmitted by the engine through the transmission to the propellers. The engines are spinning at 2200 RPM. The RPM, that always reads the engine. Always, always reads the engine. But there's a gear reduction of about 0.45 to 1 a little gearbox between the engine and the prop. So the prop is spinning a little less than half the speed of the engine. So while they're turning 2200, those props are probably turning 1000. And that's because they're like freaking 15 feet in diameter or something like that. You can't spin those 2200 RPM, so you got to slow them down. 
how do you know if you lose an engine? Well, I mean, if an engine were to quit, the prop would keep spinning, right? Because there's 215 knots of airspeed going across it. The prop governor is going to manipulate the pitch to make it hold its speed. It doesn't know if there's power or not. And so you could lose an engine and not know it because it's pretty loud in here, as you can hear. So how do we know? Well, that's why they put a torque sensor on the transmission. I won't go into how it works, but when you see BMAP, just think torque. And torque times RPM equals horsepower. So if you had a certain RPM and you're at a certain torque, you can actually calculate the horsepower going to the propeller. And if they're all at 150 and they're all at 2200 RPM, we know they're all putting out the right amount of power. And that's really what we want to know. So BMEP stands for Brake Mean Effective Pressure. And it's the equivalent pressure that if, the, if that pressure were exerted on a piston throughout its entire stroke, that's how much power it would make. So if we could somehow get 150 pounds to shove that piston from top dead center to bottom dead center, we would extract a certain amount of power. Well, with what we're doing now, that's the equivalent of power we're making. It's an ancient uh, way of measuring basically load on an engine. And it actually goes all the way back to the steam engine days when the steam pressure pushing the piston down was constant. And mechanical engineers still use it. For whatever reason, these guys have chosen to have it read BMAP. They could have had it read percent. They could have had it read foot-pounds. Doesn't matter. It's just a, it's a relative number. You just want to know what's what's a big number, what's a small number, and are they all the same? Uh, the BMAP is effective at doing that. So we got 150 across the board. We're in a nice cruise. Now, one other thing you can do with this this plane, you, know, you want to make sure. How do you know we're tuned to the right? We're picking up the right 112.5. Sometimes you go to some parts of the world. They may there may be another 112.5 nearby. You may be picking up the wrong one. How do you know you pick up the right one? Well, you listen to it. The way a VOR works is this: it's, a, it's a, there's an omnidirectional antenna that broadcasts uh, on a certain frequency. In this case, it's 112.5. And then there's a sideband antenna that rotates. So that that omnidirectional antenna is always broadcasting a signal, and then. When the rotating antenna is pointed due north, or magnetic north, excuse me, uh, they're all magnetic, so magnetic north, it actually stops broadcasting for a split second. And then the, the rotating antenna keeps rotating, and your instrument will pick it up. So if there's, if it rotates, I think, 600 RPM, if I remember right. So it looks at the time delay between that pulse in the omnidirectional signal and when the rotating signal hits it, because it'll see it cross. And from the time delay, it can calculate the angle it is from the VOR. That's how it works. So if you want to know if you're on the right VOR, what you do is you listen to the omnidirectional signal. And you do that, I don't know if you're going to hear it in this plane, but turn up the volume on the nav radio, and then you go down here, and you listen to nav one. Which we can't hear. Now you can't hear it unfortunately. There'll be a Morse code signal there. We'll do it on the ground when we get to Fairbanks. You'll just have to trust me until we get there and these engines get turned off. So we're still centering our needle on the 353 radial. Coming out of Big Lake. We're 40 nautical miles. Let's see if we can pick up Fairbanks on Nav 2. Nav 2. Way the hell over here. I'm going to use my, my different. I have a different way of tuning Nav 2, but you can do it by turning the knob. So the Fairbanks VOR is 1086. Six. No, 
know if you can see it or not. Yeah, 106 and a half, too. And we have a signal, looks like it. Pointing directly to it. Should be right in front of us. Let's see if we got a DME on it. Yep, there it is. 157 nautical miles. So at this point, we can switch over if we want to. We use Big Lake enough. Now we can switch over and let's fly directly to Fairbanks. I may have to put it on Nav 1. So to do that, we'll go to heading mode so the autopilot doesn't get all confused. So we're just going to go straight ahead now. And let's get 1086 on Nav 1. Six, one. There we have it. And again, it's right ahead. No big deal. 154 miles. Yep, same one. 154 nautical miles. We turn our OBS until we pick a nice radial to be on to fly to it. That one looks good. Then we tell the autopilot continue tracking that. It's going to fiddle a little bit until it makes itself happy. And we're inbound Fairbanks. We have 152 nautical miles to go. talk a little bit about descent. This thing takes a while to descend. So, ideally, you know, you want to be, you want about 20 miles to slow down. And, uh, you know, this thing will descend about a thousand feet a minute. So we got our initial fix, remember, was 2,600 feet. Remember the chart. You want to be at 2,600 and level out. So that'll be our descent, initial descent altitude, then we'll go to 21, then we'll see the glide slope. So, 2600, so we gotta lose, no, well, math is easy, you gotta lose 6,000 feet. And 1,000 feet a minute, that's uh, six minutes. So, well, about a five miles a minute, so, about 30 miles, plus 20 is 50, so somewhere around 50 miles outside of Fairbanks, we'll start down. Uh, we don't have a ground clearance problem on this flight, so this does not have to be a precision. You can see the whole whole portion here. The same top descends 30 miles. I'm going to start a little short of that. I'm going to start back here at about 50. But you can see it didn't under run into, so we, we don't have to worry about this. We'll be past all this stuff by then. This thing has uh, thing has featherable and reversible props. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna need that in this runway. The reversible part. But let's talk about feathering for a minute. Let's say uh, let's say we lose an engine. See, we want to get it feathered because a spinning prop is a lot of drag. So let's say we lose an engine. Well, let's just go ahead and lose one. Let's lose uh, I don't know, let's lose number one down. Okay, you see a torque falling off. The plane's making corrections. And if you notice, you know, if I wasn't paying attention, I was up here or something, you know, talking to my co-pilot. There's no change in the pitch or anything in the noise, but I lost an engine. If you look outside, it's still spinning. But that's a lot of drag, so we're going to feather that if that happens. We push this button in. Light up red. We 
should look out the window and it'll stop eventually. There it goes. All right, number one is shut down. That's too bad. We lost that engine. We've lost a little airspeed. We're still flying. It's not the end of the world. We can fly this flight on three. We've got no torque anymore. Um, got manifold pressure on one. Has dropped to twenty. That's the atmospheric pressure at this altitude. No RPM. So we're cooling off, obviously. So now what do we do? Let's say we figured out, oh crap, we ran out of gas or something. So, let's say we want to start it back up. Now, do we use the starter? Well, we don't really have to, see, because we got 200 miles an hour of wind hitting it. And that that prop is perfectly happy, to, perfectly willing to be a wind turbine to start the engine. So to do that, we unfeather it, that'll get her spinning, and then we turn the gas back on. Let's try that. Side. We're still still feathered. To unfeather, you pull this back out. We'll unfeather. Now the engine's spinning again. We're not, we're not making a torque, but we are spinning. So let's turn the fuel on. And here comes the torque. And you can see the plane responds to the torque coming back. And now we're running again. Everything looks good. Now that's how you shut down and restart an engine. Now that we got four burning again, this will this will speed back up. Autopilot's doing a good job of keeping us on the nav line while we're screwing around. Probably not good on the engine to do that, but for purposes of tutorial, uh, we'll be all right. Quick nav check. We're 130 miles out, so we got another. Thirty, fifty, uh, 80 miles to go before we start descending. Now we're getting our airspeed back. That's good for our little episode. That localizer frequency is 1091. So I'm going to monitor it with NAV2, and I'm going to put it on a standby frequency on NAV1, because the NAV1 is what we're going to use to to uh, fly the ILS. So I'm going to say 1091. There we go. Standby, so as soon as I push this button, we'll have it. And 1091 on NAV 2. And this little bar horizontal there, that's, if you look down here, kind of hard to see, I know. But the double is VOR 2, that's the NAV 2 radio. So NAV 1 is pointing at it, so we're pointing toward Fairbanks. And, uh, Nav 2 doesn't have a signal. So, as you can see over here, this will be nothing, say nothing. Eventually, what will happen is when we get in range of the ILS, this will flip around and start indicating that we've got the signal. And once we have that, I'll go on to heading. We'll probably see the airport at that point, hopefully, if we're navigating right. And, uh, and then we'll put the autopilot on uh, uh, approach mode and let it bring us down, and we'll just manage the speed in the engines on the way down. You can see uh, Denali National Park is over there. You can see part of that. It's very beautiful. See the mountains of Denali. Okay, our cabin is recovered. We now have a 600 something altitude, 4 psi differential. The cabin is no longer pressurizing or depressurizing. 
We turn the temperature up to 70 degrees. We're passing the comfort, and we're at 70 degrees. So they're nice and happy. They're toasty warm back there. We talk about a few other systems here. Sorry, my mouse and skills are kind of bad. This is a, a windshield radome. So basically, the, the windshield has got plastic in it that likes to stay warm, it's called vinyl warming. And uh, you can turn the heater off above 10 to where we are now. Here's where you set it for 10 degrees to zero. Here's where you set it zero to minus 40 Fahrenheit. And here's where you set it for anti-ice. So if you got window ice, you crank it all the way up. That puts the anti-ice heat on uh, the windshield and the radome. We don't have radar on this thing. Over here, if we do get into icing, it's really pretty simple. Um, you hit this master switch here, so that turns on the airflow heaters, which are little, the little bitty burners that run on gasoline and, and air from the, from the uh, engines, you know, the, the uh, pressurization turbines on the engines. So you turn this on, and you'll see. The cabin is 100 degrees C. That's the heat being used to heat the cabin. The tail is at zero. That's because it's not on. The tail is at zero. And the right wing. So you have a right wing, you have a left wing, and you have a tail. This is the fuel pressure. Here's the tail temperature. So there's three of them. Right wing, left wing, and tail temperature. And here's the prop the ice. So you turn that on. There's electrically heated boots on the props. So it's pretty simple. You're icing. You hit that. You hit that. And you turn on the de-ice on the window. That's everything. Now for the carburetors, it's a little different. So let me get in position here. So you can actually add carburetor heat with these levers, and they're continuously adjustable. Right? So you can lift them up and down like that. You don't want to run the icing on the, on the carb heat unless you really, really need it. Um, because it takes away power. When an engine makes power by compressing air when it's cold, heating it up, and then expanding it when it's hot. You get more power from the expansion hot than you have takes to do the compression cold. If you compress it hot, you take away some of that potential. So, we'll go back up here. These are carburetor air temperatures. Now, we're below zero because we're up at altitude, but uh, we're not in icing conditions, so we shouldn't be building up carb ice. If you do, you adjust that until it just gets about 20 degrees. That'll prevent ice from forming in the carburetor. But like I said, you don't want to do that unless you have to. There's a nice little mountains that are going to fly over. You got these controls here. It says carburetor de-icer. That's if you got a real problem. And you're choked off and there's not a lot of airflow. So you can actually spray an alcohol water solution into the carburetor. That's what this does. That's not to prevent ice. That's to get rid of ice if you've got it. In order to do that, you've got to make sure you've got anti-icing fluid, which we do. Uh, but you, you only have so much. That's how I handle icing. You've got windshield de ice. You've got airfoil de ice. You've got carburetor de, de icer and this is a heater to prevent it. So on, on, which window heat on, and start adding carb heat. That's the things that really get nasty. Talked about the pressurization system. Again, now this flight is optional anyway. Uh, I only turn it on so I can show you guys how it works. We talked about engine superchargers. Basically, there, there is a supercharger on the engine. Obviously, because we're running 35 inches of manifold pressure when it's 20 when it's 20 inches of pressure in the atmosphere up here. So obviously, there's some sort of force induction system going on. This thing has got a blower, a single blower, but it's got two speeds, high and low. So it's always on low, normally. You get up to about 12,000 feet, Remember how I was adding throttle as I climbed? What you're going to find is that when you get above 11 or 12,000 feet, somewhere depending on the barometric pressure, your throttle is going to be full forward. In other words, the plates are going to be fully open, and your manifold pressure is going to continue to drop. 
And that's because for that blower speed and that altitude, that's all it's got. So then what you do is you will decrease the throttles until the manifold pressure drops by 10 inches of mercury. Then you go up here and you flip these switches to high. That'll make the blower spin faster. Spinning faster means it puts up more, more pressure, which you need to do when there's less pressure coming in. And when we turn it on high, you'll get your 10 inches back, but your throttles will be further back. Then you can keep climbing, and you can hold a manifold pressure and a BMAP all the way till about 22,000, something like that. You get up around that altitude, and then your throttles are going to be full forward again. And at that point, manifold pressure starts to fall off. Then you've reached what's known as critical altitude, which is the altitude above which your engine's power starts falling off. Which is why this thing's cruise altitude maximum is 22, 23, something like that. Again, depending on barometric pressure, depending on temperature, a few other things. Check our navigation here. Okay, we're going to zoom in so you guys can see it. We're 94.6 nautical miles out from Fairbanks. Let's see what we're going to do. Uh, 60 miles or so. Roughly 60 miles from start down. definitely want to clear whatever this is. <laughs> I don't want to have to worry about that on the way down. These are the old radios. They, they don't work. They're not, not functional. This was our autopilot control we talked about. No, no, no. Clicked on this is the problem with zooming in. Sorry about that. I got a mouse wheel in, the mouse wheel also does stuff. So, so this is the on off lever for the autopilot right here. This puts an altitude hold mode. When this is down, this knob adjusts the pitch of the plane. That's it. There's no V speed. There is there is glide slope hold though. That's when this switches on approach. I turned off by turning off that switch or by disengaging the clutch, which is what connects the servos of the autopilot to the wheel. The problem is, if this is off and that's clutched up, you can't turn it back on. So to turn it back on, you've got to disengage the clutch, turn it on, let it stabilize, and then engage the clutch. Because you don't want to do something crazy by putting in the clutch, but it's still adjusting itself. This is just a throttle lock. That locks the throttle so you can't move the throttle levers. More of a thing in the real plane than, than anything down here. We still don't have the ILS, obviously, all those mountains around. That's another system. We covered most of it. a hydraulic lever here. I didn't actually do this. It's a common problem. So right now, down is uh, the hydraulic system is working. So hydraulic systems, you have a positive displacement pump that's going to pump a certain flow rate. Regardless of the pressure it takes, it's going to pump a flow rate. If you're not doing anything, with the hydraulic fluid, then basically what's going to happen is it's going to go through a pressure regulator that takes it from a couple thousand PSI back down to zero to go back to the reservoir. So you're pumping it up and then letting it down. Pumping it up and letting it down. You're just heating it up and wasting energy. So what this does is you took this valve and you put it in the up position. That will open up a valve. So the pump is still pumping. The flow is still flowing. But now there's no back pressure anymore. And so it short circuits back to the tank. So that saves a lot of energy and uh, saves the heating up the hydraulic fluid. However, um, you won't be able to use that because there's no pressure. And more specifically, you won't get the gear to go down, you won't get the flaps to go down, and a few other things that are, that are operating on hydraulic pressure. I'm, for this flight, I'm leaving it alone. But if, if you're flying along or something, you use the flight engineer and you put the flaps down and they don't go down, you got to make sure this lever is on the floor like this in order to build hydraulic pressure. Should 
be so here's the hydraulic system pressure put that up and you can see the pressure dropping now because the valve the, the short circuit valve is open it's dumping out the hydraulic pressure and the system's falling but now we're not wasting as much energy running that hydraulic pump of course my flaps and gear aren't going to work I don't want to worry about it later on when I'm trying to land, I'll forget about it, so I'm going to turn it back on. And there we go. It's coming back. What else we got on this thing? So we went through the feather. This has an auto feather control. It's a it's a pain. And there's some bugs in it. But the way it's supposed to work is you you arm you arm the auto feather. And then when you take off. Once you advance the throttles past a certain point, some manifold pressure, I think, or a certain BMAP, it'll arm itself. And then if the BMAP on one of the engines ever drops, indicating a failure, it will automatically feather that engine. A uh, mistake people make, though, is that they, they trip the system, and it will feather engine number one, and they won't notice. And they'll take off. And where the bug comes in is rather than the engine staying feathered, the engine will overspeed. But, like, the feather just says... I give up, and it goes to fine pitch, and then you overspeed the engine, then you crater the engine, and so people wind up with busted engines. Usually, it's because the automatic flight engineer turns this fe automatic feathering on. And by the way, um, it, with very poor cockpit practice, he flips this switch and doesn't say auto feather arm. He just flips it and doesn't say anything. He keeps, he, he keeps his mouth shut. So if you use the auto auto what do you call it, the automatic pilot, the assistant pilot thing. Once he gets, gets you set up for takeoff, I would turn this back off. And just take off without it. You save yourself a lot of headache. But if you lose an engine, you're, say you're on your own to uh, feather it. Or start the flight over. <laughs> it's the case maybe. Seventy miles. It'll take thirty to descend, and we're going to add that. So, yeah, let's start down at. Uh, we'll start down gently here. There's a few mountains, but they're pretty far below us. We'll be all right. Still no ILS yet. Monitoring that. Got your marker beacon indicators here. Pretty self-explanatory. So talk about the descent. When we get to about 60 miles take it off the altitude hold and I'm going to dial in a little nose down pitch and then I'm going to throttle back to around, around 80 beam up, something like that I'm monitoring the airspeed, I don't want to slow down too much but when we point the nose down we're going to get some increase in airspeed, I just don't want it to get too high although this plane is a little weird unlike a lot of airliners where you fly pretty close to the maximum speed you can take this thing all the way up to you know, 300 knots the engines won't do it but if you point the nose down and you're in a hurry, you can let it speed up here. You can let it get to 280, 290 on the descent. It's fine. Won't hurt the plane. Use the energy for speed. It's okay. Alright. 60. Where are we? 61. I'll go ahead and start the procedure now. You can always fly low and get a better view. So, altitude hold mode off. So now it's in pitch mode, but the pitch is level. So, we'll start now. One, two, three, four, five. Let's see what that gets us in terms of vertical. Five notches got us about 400, so we'll do another five. One, two, three, four, five. 
five. And we'll start coming back on the power. We'll come back to about there and see what happens on the airspeed that's climbing and ascending. So 800, so let's do another four. I'd like to see about a. That'll work. We'll slow down a little bit. We've done an 80 on the B map. We sped up a little bit. A little steep on the descent, so let's go back a couple here. Shooting for a thousand. It's not critical. I just don't want to come down too fast and run into these mountains. Although we're we're really high above them. little more. Nah, we'll quit fiddling. We'll leave it there. Yeah, we're in the clouds. Coming out of the clouds. There we go. Again, coming down, you're going to have to chase the BMAP coming down. As you get into the thicker air, you're going to get more air into the carburetor at a given throttle setting. So you got to close the throttle a little bit, otherwise your power will creep up on you. It's all very realistic. Fifty miles. pressure back. Yep, it's back. It's shagging. Clear the mountains. It's a good peace of mind here. Very beautiful. Yeah, BMAP creeping up again. Got a nice descent rate. We're looking for 2,600. We'll be okay to cruise there. What we want to do, we want to use that last little flat bit to slow down. This thing doesn't slow down super fast particularly if it's heavy. So I'm going to get down to about 160, 140 when we're uh, coming up on the ILS feather. Once we're at 140, once we start down the glide slope, it's going to point the nose down again. And it's going to want to speed up. Now, word on the street is that you know, these these uh, radials, if you, if you run them at zero power for a long time, essentially the propeller is spinning the engine. Uh, which it does, it'll do, that's what it's supposed to do. And we saw that when we restarted number one. But if you do that for a long time, apparently the reverse thrust bearing uh, is a little weak. And so if you run with the propeller pushing on the plane for very long, you can uh, get metal chips in the oil. So, you got to watch that. So what we do is we don't want to throttle all the way back like a jet engine. We want to throttle back a little bit. But uh, hold, you know, between seven above 70 BMF for sure. When we do that, the engine is putting just enough power into the prop to spin it, but not generate a lot of thrust. And the propellers will be on, uh, they'll be at high, they'll be at high pitch because there's not a lot of power being made. So you'll see that when we get to it. That's kind of where we are now at 80. So oh, great. Sorry about that. 
good old Microsoft. Coming up on 3,000, so that's what we gotta, gotta pay attention. So what I do is I'm just going to add some pitch and power at about 2600. I'm just going to hit the switch here at 2600. And that'll that'll level us off close enough. 28. Twenty-seven. Twenty-six. Altitude hold. Pick the nose up, and it's going to hold there. I'm going to start slowing down. I'll go to about 90. Let's see what that kind of gets us in terms of slowdown. And we're 30 nautical miles out from the airport. So we're, give or take, we're about 20 nautical miles from the ILS intercept. And that's exactly what we wanted uh, for this little slowdown slow down the zone here at 90 and uh, 90 B map. Shouldn't really have to do much else to land this thing. You want to use it? We're not going to use the landing lights today because it's Alaska. Who cares? Plenty of light. What you would do is you have to deploy them here. Over there. there are little motors. They pop out. Like pop-up headlights. And then Turn them on. So extend and then on. If you do find yourself a little bit of extra energy you'd like to get rid of, you can open the cowl flaps. Remember how I said they add drag? Well, actually, they cancel drag when they're closed. They go back to normal when they're open. Um, so you can open those up, and that'll that'll get you a little bit of energy uh, removal. If you find yourself high and hot. So we're slowing down nicely. Slow ILS. 30 miles. I'll go ahead and power back a little bit more. about navigating down to the inch so I can put this on heading or on pit, a roll mode technically which will hold the heading and switch over to 1091 on nav 1 which it doesn't have either but we'll see it nothing no reading here and nothing there got the barber poles on both of those 
pretty close though. Take a reading, I can just switch back and we're 22 to 7 on the DMV. But I'll watch you. These are going to be the same now because they're both tuned, both radios are tuned to 1091. So I'll wait till we're here. We're good on speed. I don't want to really lose too much more. So I got to keep an eye on that. I don't want to get too slow. Runway course is 2-3 magnetic. So I'll set the OBS here for 2-3. 2600, that's what we wanted. Slow down a little bit. Seems to really kind of want to stay there. So let's go to 70 on that. And we'll open up some cow flaps. That'll give us a little energy management margin. We'll go to climb setting. We don't have the glide slope. We're not on the glide slope. See that barber pole? That means we don't have the signal on the glide slope yet. So we're intercepting at 10 or so degrees here. So this is going to march its way over. Once that starts marching over, when it gets close, I'm going to turn the navigation onto localizer mode so it will steer me over toward the runway. view like that. We are 19 nautical miles from the uh, from the ILS transmitter. Or I should say 19 DME because that includes the hypotenuse of the triangle, the DME calculation. We wanted to come in at 2600. We're coming in at 2600. And we're, when we're at... Uh, plus one uh, five or six DME will be a 2100 on the on the bicycle. Okay. Now there's the airport right there. It's a little blinking light. That's our approach. There's a glide slope come active. Good. We're below it like we're supposed to be. Ideally, glide slope, you come in under it, you fly into it, collide with it like it's a ceiling above you, and then you capture it. Our speed is nice. We've slowed a little bit with the uh, help of the cow flaps. We're okay there. That's a good speed to come into the approach with. I am not going to screw with that. I'm not going to touch anything. Until that needle starts to come across. Then I'll flip him on track beam. I could put flaps down at this point if I need to lose some speed, but I'm in, I'm in a very nice balance, so I don't need to do that. We're getting really close here. Right here. That needle ought to come alive, but it does, it's going to come alive pretty quick.
it comes. Last, please. There's the runway. I have to wiggle a little bit. No big deal. Well, we're we're on the localizer. That means we're allowed to enter the glide slope. Remember, localizer first, then go on the glide slope. So I'm going to arm approach here. So when this starts coming down, which kind of looks like it is, sort of even, I don't know. I'm zoomed out too far. Yeah, it's coming down. Now we'll start getting ready to land. So, cow flaps over. slope. There's the runway. The sun's slowing down. More flaps. Flaps are what we use to slow down. At this low speed, we're pretty much doing whatever we want with the flaps. We should go back to the ridge and the mixtures. Get out. It's a good speed on final, and uh, 100 to 90 on uh, touchdown. We're fine. Reduce power a smidge. slow just yet. There's water there. Very intimidating. Cloud Master on two mile final. Mixture. We got the cow flaps open. We're not super, not heavy, so I don't need 50 flaps. Just line here at 40. Gear down. Everything's fine. I'm not going to use reverse, but just got it. We're just going to break. Ah, we can make that. 
and the landing lights, taxi lights everywhere. Flaps up. Say that's our building because we're a charter. Parking brake. Kill engines. One, two, three, four. Flaps are up, engines are off. And the easiest way to shut this thing down is to hit the crash bar, which is this thing. That shuts everything off. We are down. We are off. Welcome to lovely Fairbanks. Hope y'all learned something about old school VOR navigation in a very, very old school plane. So by way of a supplemental video, I remember I, I did forget when we landed, but I promised you guys I would show you how to verify whether or not you're tuned in to the correct VOR that you, you intended to tune. So... I'll do that now. We're just going to turn on the plane real quick. And we're going to go back to 1086, which is the Fairbanks VOR, which we are picking up. So you make sure that your volume is turned up on your nav radio. And you go down here and you select nav 1 on speaker. Can you hear that? That's, that is the signal that the Fairbanks VOR is transmitting on its omnidirectional antenna that will break um, when the, uh, when the rotating, rotating antenna is headed 0 or 360. It will stop the signal, and that tells your plane when to start its clock so that it can figure out what radial it's on. So how do we know that's right? Well, each one of these things has... A unique Morse code that you can look up. So we have dot 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 dash dot dot dash dot dot. That's confirmation that we are in fact tuned to the Fairbanks VOR. So that's how you do the verification. And you can turn it back off. That's the supplemental thing I promise you. When you do that in the air, it's just a little tricky in this plane because it's so loud. So there you go. That's what I promised you. Have a good day.